Welcome to our Sound for Video session, everybody, Soundies. Uh, we are glad to have you here today, and we have a full agenda, so let's go ahead and switch over to our agenda and see what we've got going for today. First up, um, I have a camera that needs a new home. We'll talk about that in just a second here. Um, I just also wanted to let people know about uh, an upcoming online event called the Sound Summit. It's hosted by Sound Devices, and it includes manufacturers of various, um, a whole bunch of different manufacturers of production sound gear. And so that's coming up. If you're interested in attending, that is actually later this week. You don't have to attend the whole thing, but you do. I think you need to register. So just head on over to the soundsummit.org if you're interested in that. Um, we'll do a little bit of a demo here with our new channel strip. And if if um, you could just let us know in the chat here, how are things sounding? Are we sounding okay? Just give us a thumbs up or or uh, not so good and you need some work. <laughs> One of the two would be very helpful. And then after that, we will jump into our Q&A. And on that channel strip demo, I should come back and say, we also will demo a new microphone that I'm working with here. Um, you're not hearing it right now. Right now I am on the Earthworks SR314, but um, we will be coming back to the, um, we'll be coming to this other mic as well. Okay, so, uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this camera, which needs a new home. Um, so whoever is interested in this, if you could just email me at Curtis at Learn, Light, and Sound. Sorry, this is not really sound related, but uh, this is a camera that I think it needs a new home. It's a pocket cinema camera 4K. It's got a half cage from Tilta, as well as a V-mount battery plate that it sits on top of here. Um, if, if this would be a camera that would be of use to you, if you could email me, I'm happy to sell it for $400 US. It also comes with the uh, its AC adapter, and it also comes with a D-tap to, um, there's a proprietary connector here to power the camera. So $400 US plus shipping, and uh, if just email me at curtis at learnlightandsound.com if you're interested. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on to the good stuff here. Um, next up, uh, let's talk a little bit about the signal chain you're hearing today. Um, I don't know if Lloyd's here today. Lloyd, are you around? Anyone seen Lloyd? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Had a conversation with Lloyd a couple weeks ago. Um, we are actually trying out a new channel strip here. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept of a channel strip, a channel strip is a, um, it's usually a microphone preamplifier. Oftentimes it will have some audio processors along with it. A great example of a channel strip that many of you are familiar with is the DBX-286S. However, there are lots of different channel strips available out there. Um, in this particular case, um, I actually, Bandrew and I talked about it a little bit, and then uh, Lloyd and I talked about it as well. And so we are actually sh uh, sporting a new Rupert Neve Design Shelford channel. So the idea with this is a more modern design of, well, let me give you some history. First of all, who is Rupert Neve? Rupert Neve is a designer of originally consoles. So he was he was designing the consoles that you saw in the really big recording studios. And I think he started designing them back in the 50s, I think it was. Um, so in any case, he has, he's created a lot of really legendary consoles, really understands, um, you know, how to how to design a preamplifier and um oh, we've got a little bit of a boxy thing going on here we're, we're we're we've broken one of the cardinal rules of live streaming we are actually trying multiple new technologies today <laughs> and uh our little chat thing has some issues so we're bear with us on that if you would all right um so anyway back to rupert neve um, i won't give you the whole history here because i don't know the whole history but he is a very talented uh, designer of audio gear, mostly preamplifiers, compressors, limiters, and things of that nature. So his his designs are all analog. So this is an all analog channel strip. We're gonna. I didn't have time to do as much as I'd hoped to when I sent out the announcement yesterday. So we're not gonna do uh, a big comparison using running multiple microphones through this. And I wasn't able to get it working with my Apollo. It wouldn't take it as a line input. Anyway, long story. This is what you're hearing today. So it does have um, it does have the compressor and just a little tiny bit of EQ applied. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the. It also has some what they call silk, uh, which adds some additional processing. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. There's two flavors, red and blue. 
This is now you're hearing the red. Are you hearing a difference there when I turn that on? Okay. So there's the red at 100%. So you can blend it. You don't have to do it 100%. There's about 50% there. And then that's turning it back off so you're not hearing the red silk. Um, there's the red silk at 50%. And then here's again the red silk at 100%. Just so you can hear how that sounds. And then let's try the blue silk here. Here's the blue silk at 100%. Does that sound different to you? It does? Okay. <laughs> blue silk at 100%. Here's blue silk at about 50%. And then here's with the blue silk back off. So you're just getting a flavor here um, for what these do. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the blue silk back off. Okay, now it's off. So that's sort of the a lot of the vintagey sound, if you will. Um, it kind of changes not only the EQ a little bit, but I think it also does some things in terms of harmonics and uh, saturates at certain harmonics. I'm not entirely sure how it works. We're going to work with it over the next few weeks here. But I just want to I'm, I'm I just wanted to share with you um, kind of the beginnings of exploring a high-end channel strip and kind of what you can expect from something like that. So again, I'll do a lot more work with it over the next coming weeks. And uh, we'll take a closer look here on the on the channel as well on one of our live streams. All right, let's go ahead and talk about a microphone here. Let's switch over to this one. Excuse me, I have some my allergies hitting the fall time. time. <laughs> Harder than in the other time. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Did we switch over? Yes, we are switched over. Okay. I'm now working with a different microphone here. This is this one right here. This is the Shure KSM-8 Dualdyne Dynamic Microphone. Uh, this is, I think uh, Shure released this somewhere in 2015, I think. Um, are you giving, is everything working okay? Okay. <laughs> this one's really hard to tell if it's on or not. It's hard to tell if it's on or not. Um, like I can't tell if there's any level. Okay. Um, volume too low. Stand by. Let's just double check something here. Okay. Checking one, two, three, four, five. Anyway, okay, so this is this is where it's going to be. Let me see if I can push the mix a little bit. Okay, we'll push the mix there. There we go. Um, okay, so again, Shure KSM-8. This is a dual dyne, so it's a dual diaphragm dynamic microphone. In fact, I understand it. It was one of the very first, if not the first, dual diaphragm dynamic microphone design. Um, that's a tricky thing to design but they wanted to address a couple of problems. Um, first of all, I think they were aiming for a sound that was a little bit more like a condenser microphone, more detailed. So a lot of dynamic microphones, especially the older designs, really kind of fall off in the upper frequencies. And they tend to have a lot of, I don't know, they tend to be a little erratic to me. Like the Shure SM50, or sorry, yeah, SM58, classic microphone used in so many venues around the world. But to me, it didn't sound, it had kind of a weird, it did some funny stuff in the high frequencies, in short. <laughs> um, this is supposed to address some of that, but also it's supposed to address um, proximity effects. So you shouldn't get quite as much proximity. You'll definitely get some proximity effects still. Here I am basically right up on it, but you shouldn't see as much of a dramatic effect as you would on the SM58 or SM57 or a lot of other handheld performance dynamic microphones. So. This one we'll have in testing here over the next little while, and we'll do a formal review at some point here, probably in the November timeframe. So looking forward to that. Okay, let's switch back over. All right, we should now be on uh, back over here on the Earthworks SR314. I'm going to go ahead and move this guy out of the way for me. Okay, there we go. All right, let's jump into our question and answer session and see what we've got there today. All right, first up from James. I've been wondering if you have thoughts on what level of RX software is a better buy for certain use cases. So just to give this some context, we're talking about Isotope RX, which is a audio cleanup suite of processors. Uh, and he asks specifically, like, will podcasters benefit from RX Advanced or is it overkill and they would be better off with the RX Elements suite? Let me pause there and just address that one first of all. So that one... Um, 
Actually, let me just, I'm going to read all of them and then we'll pop over and take a look at the RX site and I'll, I'll kind of talk through things. For independent filmmakers, would the post-production suite be a justifiable purchase with things like RX, RX Advanced, Nectar 3, and Dialogue Match? Or do you think it would be more beneficial to get RX Standard and invest the difference in equipment? That's a harder question. Um, but maybe the answer to these questions would take more time than is available. If so, I completely understand. I'm using RX Advanced Trial right now and a Nectar 3 trial, but the learning curve, I don't think I'll get deep enough into them to say if I need these versions versus the Elements versions. Let me talk first about that more kind of, I think what is, I would say is a more complex question there in the middle for independent filmmakers. So I, I think it really depends on what you're doing. Um, and your budget. I mean, frankly, that's a lot of money. RX production suite is a lot of money. I think it's a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. That's a lot of money to spend just on plugins. Is that? Uh, it, it could be perfectly valid um, if you've got the budget for it. And there are tools in the advanced version that I would find useful for, um, even for independent filmmaking. But it's is it strictly is it strictly necessary? I don't think so. So. It really depends on the situation. So let's go ahead and switch over to the RX website and take a look at that and show you the differences here. So RX Elements has the DHUM. Um, they made a big deal about horizontal scrolling, which <laughs> that's cool. It's not, I mean, it is a, it's a useful thing, but it's kind of funny that that's a big list on the uh, a, a bullet point item. So you'll notice that the Elements version also includes D-click, D-clip, uh, the repair assistant, voice denoise, um, kind of the basics. So that's, that's and if you keep scrolling down here, let's see if it includes anything else. I think that might be all that it includes. Oh no, it does have some more. So third-party plugin hosting, fade, find similar, gain, mixing, module chain, normalize. Oh, it does have, it has phase now. That's interesting. So actually in that light, I would say as a signal generator, spectrogram, recording and monitoring. Okay, I would actually say that the, the element suite has come a long way since I last looked at it. So I think that that would be a great place to start and you can always upgrade from there. So James, to answer your question in short, if I were, you know, again, not knowing a whole lot about your situation or the budget or what kind of challenges you'll be facing on your particular projects, I would say that elements is a great place to start. And um, you can always upgrade from there if you're finding that that's not serving your needs entirely. So that that would be my take. Let me let me go back to the, the website and just talk a little bit about what else is available in RX, just so you can get a sense in the advanced version and the standard version. So let's go ahead and switch over. I shut that tab. Um, <laughs> okay, we, uh, we we don't have it up anymore. But the, the main thing that I use in the adva advanced version is, um, I believe the D-Reverb may be in the standard version or it might only be in the ad advanced version. That actually comes in handy sometimes. Um, sometimes during production, you end up in a, in a very reverberant room. Even hanging sound blankets, sometimes you're still getting a lot more reverb than you'd like. So that can be helpful for sure. But again, that's kind of like a next level of touch, like a, like a I don't know. It really depends on, you know, again, how how much are you willing to invest is really what it comes down to. So well, I guess I'll leave it at that. I would say for a podcaster, I'd start with the Elements version. And then if you're finding that you're not able to do everything you need to do, then you can upgrade at some point in the future. Another thing to keep in mind, too, is that when you start working with audio, just like with cameras and, uh, you know, doing director of photography and color grading and things of that nature your capabilities change over time. So you'll start to notice things that uh, you identify as problems and you'll want to fix them as your abilities kind of mature. So that's perfectly fine too. I would start again, James, if you're, you know, I, jumping into RX Advanced, there's a lot there. <laughs> I would start with the Elements version. We'll take it from there. Okay, let's go back to our questions here and see what we have up next. Thanks for that, James. Next up from Dick is for the 888 series of sound devices, there's a new feature called a compressor. When do you use this in your workflow, live versus post-production? And do you set the compressor on an input or later on in the signal chain? Can you show the possible settings and what your preferred and what are your preferred settings? Are there any other functions in version seven you like or want to use? Let's go ahead and pop over to the sound devices website first and we'll take a look at what's new in the version seven firmware. So there are a number of things that they've added. So this is gonna be the eight series. So that's gonna be the 833, the 888, and the Scorpio. So kind of their 
flagship line right now. Um, first of all, they've added su uh, super slot support for an additional WYSIWYGON receiver. So that's good. And you can actually control the WYSIWYGON receiver from the 8 series, which is really, really nice. When I get my SL2 slot system back, it was actually recalled and I had to send it back to Sound Devices. But um, <laughs> once I get it back, we'll go ahead and show it to you. Um, there's a new version of SD Remote, which is the remote app, and you now have control of faders from your iPad or tablet, and so that's pretty cool as well. Um, compressors are kind of the headline feature. There are also some additional things, so you can, on the Scorpio, for example, you can now receive audio, let's see, I'll, I'll just go ahead and let you read those if you're interested, but basically... Um, you have some additional settings on the limiter. You can change the threshold ratio, knee attack, and release, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you can add cue marks, so cue markers, additional USB shortcuts, which is cool, USB keyboard shortcuts, um, additional SL2 antenna filter options, which is really, really important. I'm actually pretty excited to... Actually, I should say, I have an announcement <laughs> that will come along with this, but... Um, so there's just a whole ton of additional things that were put into this firmware update. So definitely take a look at it if you're interested in the details. I would say that the compressor is really definitely one of the top things on the list. So let me go ahead and show you over here. But before I do, um, go ahead and switch to the overhead cam here. Um, so I do have, I'm actually collaborating with my friend Michael Wynn to work on a new course talking specifically about wireless microphone systems. And um, the reason I brought that up is what triggered my memory was that they, they have some additional antenna filtering with the new firmware update with the SL2, which is really nice. And um, we'll have more details about the upcoming wireless course as we get closer, but just wanted to let you know that's one of the things we do have in the works here. And it's not, it's not like a wireless course like how to use your Deity Connect. It's more of a, here are all the principles of wireless, RF theory, understanding frequencies, um, that kind of stuff to really kind of help you make a good decision about what works best for you. So it will help you kind of get the background information you need to know to figure out either to make the most of the wireless systems that you already have or to make a decision about which wireless microphone system may be the best for, for your projects and what you're working on. Okay, back over to the Sound Devices 888. So you'll notice here, actually, let me come into the channel here. So here just on the channel, I do have the compressor available now. Um, it's right here. So if I come in here, I can go ahead and turn that on. I can set the threshold, the ratio, the, uh, whether it's a soft or hard knee, the attack and the release settings. So, um, Dick, in regards to your question, um, I, don't, uh, there, I don't have favorite settings and I don't have settings that I can tell you to use, but I would say this for dialogue. Usually for dialogue, I'll have a pretty lightweight ratio, like a two to one, maybe a three to one. I'll generally keep it soft knee. My attack will be somewhere in the 10 milliseconds range because I want it to be somewhat transparent. I don't want it to sound really hardcore, like we're crushing the sound. Um, release, I'll generally, you know, you can play with that. You use your ears. That's this, that's really the secret. And then, of course, with my headphones on and the person talking through one of the mics, I'll use this threshold here to kind of fine-tune the sound. Using these settings here, don't get too wrapped up in the numbers. Always use your headphones and your ears to make the decisions about where things should be set. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of a, there's some thoughts on where I, where I would start. Now that's on the input channel. Um, you can also, if we come back in here into the bus menu, you can see here, if I come into the left and the right bus, for example, I come into more, I can turn the compressor on or off here. So I also have bus compressors and limiters. So I can turn the compressor on here and I have all the, access to all the same settings there as well. So. The question, I think, is really, when does this make sense to use this? When would you want to use a compressor with a field recorder like this? So my thought is that it's most useful when we, uh, for me, as a corporate video shooter, it's going to be more useful in really straightforward shoots. I might just put, a, for example, a compressor on the left and right mix, and that way I can use those. Um, potentially in post. So if everything works out well, that way I still have my ISOs that I can go back to if I screw something up and set it wrong. Um, but I've got the mix that I can use uh, for a quick turnaround as well. If I'm doing something live, granted that these aren't really made for live mixing, but the reality is, especially in corporate video, sometimes I end up doing live type things as well. 
And so in those cases, I think it could be useful as well, just to kind of contain the overall you know, variable dynamic range in people's voices. So those would be circumstances where I might use that as well. So, all right, let's go ahead and make sure we got everything on Dick's question here. Um, yeah, I would say, Dick, there are a ton of things. I, and I, if I remember right, you, if you, I think you have one of the 8 Series recorders, and I think you do mostly live streaming. I think in your case, yeah, that compressor would be really welcome news, really helpful, um, just to even out the voice because you're trying to, you know, you try, you got, that'll help you manage your overall loudness as well in the live stream. And I find that's a problem with a lot of live streams is, and even here with my own, <laughs> we were coming in kind of hot, uh, not very hot on this other microphone here. So, um, but a compressor will definitely help you manage that in a live stream situation. So thanks for the question, Dick. All right, next up from Clayton, who has a series of questions. Number one, why do headphone creators mainly use that material that will eventually easily flake off? Is there a way to replenish this texture? This is my second pair of headphones to get to this place where it flakes. Um, yes, I, I, my take on that is that they're using, you know, relatively cheap pleather type ear cups, and they're trying to save money. They're trying to deliver to you a headphone that's affordable and that still makes them some money. So that's if I if I had to answer, <laughs> that's my guess as to what they're doing. In terms of preventing that, I actually use um, what are called softies. If you go to B and H and just search for softies or softies headphone covers. Um, they're sort of a velour type material that goes over those and I use those and I really like those They work pretty nicely and they prevent that They also are really nice from the standpoint that when you're working in really hot weather You're not going to sweat as much in those kind of pleather, you know, plastic fake leather kind of head cups uh, Or ear covers and then also when it's cold, they don't feel quite as cold as well So it's they make it a lot more comfortable for me and maybe that'll help you as well Number two, while on the topic of headphones, I know you like to mix in open-backed headphones. What about recording sound? The headphones I have are closed. Yeah, when I'm recording, it's all closed back. So I'm using Sony MDR7506s, or there's also Sonal, which makes a, I don't remember the exact model number, something 1000, I think it is. Um, for those, I um, use, yeah, those are all closed. Closed. You definitely need closed when you're working in, uh, when you're doing recording. And then Bang's Naughty Bits also mentioned here, I used Wicked something covers. <laughs> Those are, it's in the chat if you're interested in his details there. So thanks for that, Bangs, as well. All right, and then Clayton goes on. Also had a location sound gig recently where my boom mic all of a sudden picked up some noise or interference at the end of the city street. However, my wireless Rode Lav Filmmaker kit was fine. Both are attached and are the same segment of audio showing the point of the most noise. <clears throat> we went with the recording... Um, we went with the recording because the lav mic was fine. However, I am curious what you think you're hearing in the attached recording of the boom. I disconnected all my cables, not sure what was making the noise. I was not able to get the noise to go away until we left the location. Still, um, I'm not sure what it is and if it's something I can avoid. A solution that came to mind for me was to make the boom mic wireless since the lav was not having any issue. However, I'm curious any insights into this issue. Granted, it doesn't come up too often, but I'm wondering if I need to replace a cable or a mic, etc. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, I pulled that up in Adobe Audition. And we're just going to pull that up here. There we go. Okay, so if you can see here, here's the spectrogram view. And I don't know if you can see, Emma, if you could point out those little clicks... So those are actually, and let's see if we can play it actually. Let's go ahead and play. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on if you could play through it. Okay, now we're ready. Okay, so I don't know if you could hear that or not. It was the levels were a little bit on the low side, but um, that sounds to me like RF interference, Clayton. And so my guess is that your it's either your road system is doing that, and your cable is picking it up, or your microphone is picking it up, um, or maybe your phone or some other RF interference. But it sounds very much like a phone, and is, what it sounds like to me is Wi-Fi or LTE or 4G or whatever. It sounds something like that. That sort of digital sounding interference. 
So, um, would putting your boom mic on a wireless system solve that? Well, it would. It might have solved it in that situation, but it might have also it might also introduce other issues in other situations. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I'd take a closer look at your um, your cable, and then um, I recently invested from my friend Sound Speeds. He's over on YouTube. Many of you are familiar with him, Alan Williams. He's been making cables. I think he's only doing it through the end of the month, but he uses Canary Star Quad cabling, some of the highest end Neutrik connectors. He also puts a ferrite core on the end of the cable. Um, you probably want to go high quality like that if you, you know, to, to help prevent these types of issues. So that that's the kind of the best advice I have is for your boom cable, I would not cheap out, go high end, go Canary or Mogami at least um, with really high end connectors as well. So that's my best advice on that. Um, some microphones have a tendency to not be too RF immune as well, so you'll have to keep your eye on that. That's another possibility to keep in mind. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Okay, let's see what else we've got here from our friend Clayton. I think there's one more question. Okay, next up, do you use bongo ties for anything? Do you think it's a possible it's possible to use it as a cable wrangler instead of Velcro? on my Orca bag. Yeah, you definitely could use bongo ties for that. And for those that aren't familiar, I included uh, Clayton's photo here. He's got a couple of bongo ties holding a Rode wireless filmmaker kit. I think that's the, that must be the transmitter there. Yeah, the transmitter to his boom pole, it looks like. So those are super helpful. They're basically elastic bands with those uh, connectors that allow you to very quickly attach them and detach them. And yeah, definitely could be used for wrangling cables in sound bags. I think there are some cases where a Velcro strap will work a little bit better, um, but definitely an option there. And bongo ties are fairly affordable and I think definitely worth uh, an investment. I, I use them. I have some cheaper ones. <laughs> and even if you don't want to invest in the uh, the actual bongo ties, there are, you've probably seen them, the... Um, they're actually made for holding ponytails and things like that. So they have the little two kind of like plastic marbly balls and you can, they work basically the same way. You can use those as well. If you need if kind of lighter duty type things and you don't want to spend as much money. So, all right. Thanks for those Clayton. Appreciate the questions. Next up from saying a series of questions here. First of all, I've been looking it to buy the sound devices mix pre and have been debating between the mix pre three, two versus the mix pre six, two. And notice that the Mix Pre 6 only has four input preamps. What makes a Mix Pre 6 a six channel mixer? In the spec, it says eight track, six inputs plus a stereo mix. Where are the other two inputs? Is it talking about the 3.5 millimeter TRS input? If that's the case, how does that work? Saying that you are exactly right on. So that 3.5 millimeter input is a stereo input. Um, it's an unbalanced input. So it does have a preamplifier behind it as well. Um, so that's really, <clears throat> that's how they're counting the inputs on the Mix Pre series. Um, th that's just sort of a stretch. It it's a normal practice in the audio gear world to count all the inputs. <laughs> and so things will look like they have a whole lot more inputs than are necessarily the usable inputs for your particular use case. So that's where the it comes from. Um, I would prefer if they didn't do that, but I mean, on the other hand, it is counting all the inputs. You just have to do your research. So yes, the Mix Pre 6 2 has four XLR combination inputs. So mic line inputs plus an additional 3.5 millimeter stereo input. And then the reason they call it an eight track recorder is because the recorder part of it can actually record eight simultaneous tracks, which includes all six physical inputs plus a stereo mix. So that's where you get all those different numbers. So yes, you're right on, um, and that's how that that's how that works. So if you need more than four XLR inputs, then you're probably going to need to look at something else, like a Mix Pre 10 or maybe a, one of the Zoom recorders. All right. Follow-up question from a few weeks ago regarding loudness normalization in DaVinci Resolve. I've been editing a, editing a few videos for my church's service and have been using Resolve to loudness normalize between a few different audio levels. Some of the background music I get online is very loud, waveform pretty much maxed out, while recording of the sermon portion is much tamer. I use the relative setting to normalize the audio, and it feels like the output is very quiet and doesn't seem very normalized, and I feel like I got better results if I use the independent setting. 
I've had people complain that the audio level uh, was very different between segments when I used the relative setting. Do you know why I might be getting this result? I'm attaching screenshots of what my waveforms look like. So saying I, my advice would be don't use normalize to do your mixing. Um, and, I, and I think this is probably my fault for the way I've described this in the past without clarifying. Always save loudness normalization for the very last step when you have already mixed everything. So your first job is to get things at the same, you're, you're trying to make a good, your mix is making a good experience for your audience. So turn your volume up to wherever it's comfortable and you need to adjust the faders on your different input levels on the music tracks versus the dialogue tracks to get them to a comfortable level so that the music isn't overpowering the dialogue or the sermon in this case. Use your ears to determine that level. Don't, I wouldn't fiddle around with loudness normalization to do that or any sort of normalization. Peak normalization, even worse. So don't do that. Use your ears to get them to a comfortable level that work together. And then when you're done with your entire mix, that's when you go back in loudness normalize the entire mix to get it to a reasonable level. So that would be my main advice for you there. And hopefully that makes things a little bit more consistent for you and easier for your audience to listen to. All right. And then on the final note here, um, would you be able to talk, walk through how you would go about normalizing and processing audio in this situation? The information you talked about in the RX-8 demo stream was really helpful, but I'm wondering if you can walk through how you would process and deliver this kind of these kind of videos. So um, yes, that I'll put on my to-do list. So obviously we don't have time to do that here today, but I'll put it on my to-do list and we'll take another look at that. We have done that in the past. Um, we did do one video um, someone had sent in some music and dialogue, and I did, and I demonstrated exactly how to do this. But the problem was that I didn't realize um, that there was a copyright on that music, and so it was taken down. So, if you have some dialogue and music that you can send over that is not copyrighted that we can use in this demonstration, we'd be happy to use that. Or I'll do my best to find some, and we can do it on that level. So, okay, uh, back to the questions. See what else we've got here. Next up from Joe. This is not so much a question, but a comment he left. I have an Edutige, I don't know how you say that, Edutige ETM008 unidirectional microphone, which is a rather large lav mic that I've not used in a few years, but finally found a good application for it. I do a lot of rifle and pistol shooting range videos and can't control how many other people will be near me while I'm making my own video. I also want to minimize my gear and I use cheap, almost disposable camcorders, one at the shooter position and one at the target. I use a Tascam DR10L with a lav mic and my shirt because I alternate locations between the shooting bench and the target, which can be 100 to 500 meters away. A couple of weeks ago, I added a Zoom H2N recorder and the unidirectional lav mic on a tabletop stand at the shooting table to the left of the rifle, mic pointed at me parallel to the rifle barrel. This was close enough to catch my voice with the gain pretty low, but directional enough to minimize input from fellow shooters perpendicular to the mic axis, yet still get the sound from my rifle action when cycling the bolt. Big improvement over the Omni Lav, which picked up everything with gross peaking on the gunshot, even from a 22. Point is this, I would never have considered experimenting with this if it wasn't for your channel. Thanks a bunch. Joe, thanks for sharing that. That, I think, is really good information for people to consider. So understanding your gear and understanding, for example, polar pattern, that is a huge tool that we have to use in many circumstances to solve problems. So definitely start thinking about those things and find ways to solve these problems. I think a lot of times some of the gear that we have already can solve those problems. Um, cardioid lavalier microphones are not my favorite for mounting to someone's chest, <laughs> but they can have their purposes. I think Joe's example is a great example. Another example is if you're working in a, you know, like a factory where there's an enormous amount of noise around you, that can be a potential problem solver. So it's not like a rule of thumb that cardioid lavalier microphones are huge and bad. It's That's not true. They're just not necessarily a good fit for certain situations. And so um, good job, Joe, for thinking outside the box and, and finding ways to get that existing gear to solve your problems. All right, next up from Alex. First, thanks for helping me figure out how to record directly to a GH5 via MixPre. You're an amazing person. I think it will be good to share with the audience that recording directly from the MixPre to a GH5 has its own limitations. Um, just some background information. Uh, Alex and I went back and forth this week getting his MixPre and his GH5 hooked up to each other via HDMI to control the 
um, recording on and off. So for example, and time code, so that when he pressed record on the camera, it would start recording on the mix pre as well. So we got that sorted out. Um, there were some settings that he hadn't, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. There are a number of settings you have to set up to make that work. So <laughs> we got that sorted up and then, and then let me show you here what he has going on. It works. Uh, actually, no, go back one here. There we go. It works only when I get the GH5 set to record in move MOV format, which is quite a limitation, meaning bigger files and no 4K option on the GH5. So Alex, actually, um, in MOV format, I'm able to record in 4K without a problem. In fact, um, I, al I almost always record in MOV format on my GH5 and almost always in 4K. So I'm not sure what's going on there. I guess I'd need more information on why you feel like you're not getting the ability to shoot in 4K when you're set on MOV, because you should be able to have that option. Um, MP4, you, yeah, and he's also said he's going to contact Panasonic and see what they say about that. I think my, my sense is that there are some limitations to MP4 uh, just as a codec, so that might be what they come back with, but we'll, we'll be interested to hear what you hear from them. All right, going on. I started out in my production sound devices mix pre and shotgun mics and feeling so far mixed. To get to minus 20 to minus 10 dB range, I need to put the gain above 50. Not sure if I do it right or if I need to use more the fader. I feel it's getting more noise shooting outdoors compared to lavs I'm used to working with. So yeah, let me pause there. So Alex, that is definitely the, the, the case here. You are going to pick up more ambiance typically with a boom mic versus lavalier microphones. Not always, but oftentimes. And um, part of part of that is what makes a, a boom mic sound a little bit more natural is that it's not quite as isolating in many cases. Not, and again, this is not 100% of the time. It depends on the microphone. And in this case, you're shooting with a um, Deity S Mic 2S. That's a very short shotgun microphone. And that also is one of the, micro, the shotgun microphones with a widest polar pattern. It is not nearly as focused as most other boom microphones. So that one in particular will pick up more ambient sound. You have to get it basically right up on the person if you really want to isolate. So that's something to keep in mind for sure. The It's a good mic, don't get me wrong, but if you're really trying to isolate the sound, the dialogue sound, and you want even less ambiance than you're getting with that, you're going to want to go to a longer shotgun microphone. So something like a Shure, or sorry, a um, Rode NTG3, Sennheiser MKH416, if you really want to get focused, the Senken CS3E is a good choice. So... Um, some thoughts on that. Okay, let's go ahead and see if we got everything on Alex's question. Um, yeah, I don't know when you're where you're placing your microphone exactly. If we go, let's jump ahead to the photo and we'll come back here. So here's a photo. I can't tell exactly from the photo, but it looks like you have that boom mic probably within 60 centimeters or 70 centimeters. But if you can get it closer, I think you're going to get less ambiance and you won't have to push up the gain so much. If you have to push the gain to 50 dB of gain in the mix pre for that S Mic 2S, um, I think you're working a little bit farther away than I would recommend to get a, a more isolated sound. So let's go ahead and switch back to the question. Um, so then, then you talk about faders. Um, uh, when I use the faders on the mix pre, it's influencing the individual track, but not the mix. That means you're in basic mode. And in that case, they're actually not faders. They are gain trims. So if you're trying to influence the overall contribution of a mic to the mix then you probably need to be in custom mode or advanced mode and um, i know i believe you have the mix pre-course alex and so if you want to jump into the mix pre-course we cover that in some detail so rather than going over all that right here um, then you go on the mics i use currently is the s mic 2s from deity again that's that really short shotgun microphone planning on getting a chef's or dpa but not sure that will improve dramatically the quality maybe i should stick with top quality lobs well it really depends on what you're trying to do i would almost always use a lavalier and a boom microphone if i could and um in, you know you can do a, a variety of things with that if you find the lav sounds closer to what you want then go with the lav. That's that's perfectly legitimate. You can actually mix them as well. You'll have to get them in phase, so you may need to just slide them just a little bit to make sure they're perfectly in phase. Um, but then you can mix them, and you can mix maybe the boom mic back a little bit so you don't get quite as much ambiance, but you still have the ambiance there. I think a, a principle that's important to talk about here is that you don't want total isolation. When you're recording something outdoors, the person needs to sound like they're outdoors. Now, you don't want distraction. You don't want ambiance sound that's so overwhelming that it distracts from the you know the interview or the talking head or whatever you're shooting 
but you also don't want something that sounds like it's shot in a studio when you're outdoors because then it sounds fake um, and it takes it and I can actually pull people out of the story so I think there's a balance there I think that lavalier microphones there there is a use case for definitely mixing a lav and a boom together um, but again you're just gonna have to make sure you get them in phase so that they work together um, so Anyway, so there are some thoughts there. And again, thanks for sharing the photo there. Uh, just one other thing that I didn't have room to put in here. Alex is actually in Israel. He's had some pretty good success um, getting his little production company started up, and he's doing really well. So congratulations, Alex. Keep up that work. For those of you that are thinking about doing more of that as, you know, as that possibility opens up during, you know, as the pandemic hopefully starts to fade away, um, yeah, there are definitely some opportunities out there. So Keep up the good work, Alex, and hopefully that that's helpful to others as well. All right, let's go to the chat and see if we've got any questions in the chat that uh, we can take a look at here. We're using a new, <laughs> I'm going to describe this. Um, our director, Emma, is doing a great job today. She's having a challenge here because we switched over to a different chat overlay. And um, this new chat overlay is not working as seamlessly or in the same way that... Um, the chat overlay we used to use from so we were using a version that was from Aaron Parecki and then the guy who wrote the original version we we, were, we decided to try his just because it has a it uses chroma key instead of luma key I'm not going to dive into all the details here but um, anyway it's kind of the ATEM is not cooperating <laughs> so anyway let's go let's go to the chat here and see what we've got okay first up how much noise would you expect outboard analog gear to introduce as little as possible, <laughs> I guess. I mean, every every piece of the signal chain can impose some additional self-noise. So um, if you're using quality outboard gear, I would expect not a whole lot. So um, there's something to consider there. I'm gonna actually make a change to my compressor here. We just dropped the compression ratio down to two. It was at three. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear a difference there or not, but um, that's what we're doing there. So to answer your question, Bangs, I really, you know, as little as possible, I you'll have to experiment with your particular gear just to see what it's going to do. But, um, you know, with quality outboard gear, you shouldn't be, and quality cables, and, you know, again, it's everything in the signal chain is a potential contributor to self-noise. So if you're using the highest quality products and, you know, components within that signal chain, then you shouldn't expect a whole lot. Um, but every time you add some more stuff to the signal chain, then there's the potential to add more. So in this case, we're um, actually, I should describe that actually. In this case, we're going from the Shelford channel uh, directly out to the Canon C200. So it's getting digitized at the Canon C200. Um, of course, it's coming out of the Shelford channel at line level. So we're bypassing the preamp in the Canon C200 and just using the analog to digital converter. Once it's in digital format, it's coming HDMI over to the ATEM, and that's all the processing we're doing. So it's a fairly straightforward signal chain in this case. Um, but I guess the short answer is, if, if you're using high-quality components, I wouldn't expect an appreciable amount of additional self-noise um, unless you get to really complex signal chains with a lot of stuff in it. So thanks for the question. Uh, next up, you want, uh, Camille, you want to sell the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K to make room for the Canon C70 or the Sony A7S III? Um, well, fair enough. Uh, this is not really a sound for video discussion, but we'll go ahead and have it anyway, because most of us also work with cameras and my director is shaking her head. <laughs> um, so we haven't used the Pocket 4K for a long time, not because it's not a good camera, but because it just hasn't fit the need of what we're doing here. Um, I use the Pocket 6K for 99% of the talking head shots that we do for our weekly videos on the main channel. I use the Canon C200 for the live streams. It was originally bought for corporate video, and, and it will be used for that eventually again. But um, we're not finding a need to use it. So um, I, my thinking is we, well, we did. So we bought, we pre-ordered a Canon C70. Um, I'm not really a Sony, I'm not in the Sony ecosystem. And I figured if I was going to invest in a new set of lenses, which the C70 uses the RF lens mount instead of the EF lens mount, that it probably made more sense um, to go with a Canon. And, and that's really probably a minor concern. But the, the biggest thing was 
Um, the Canon C70 fits my workflow better than a hybrid camera. So I've, I have hybrid cameras, GH5, GH5S, and we use those. Um, for example, this overhead camera that we used earlier on, and actually we can switch back over to it now here really quickly. So this is the GH5. Um, you guys have seen this a thousand times. I use it in my courses extensively. Been a great camera for what it does. But um, when it comes to doing talking head things, I think the C70 will probably be coming my, my main live stream camera. Um, we'll see. We'll see how it works out. But yeah, we did invest in a C70 here, so we'll see how that goes. That's all I have to say on that matter. I think the A7S III looks like a really cool camera too. So if you're into that <clears throat> and it's something that will work for your workflow, by all means do it. Okay, next up, what's the best way to auto start recording if it's a Fujifilm X-T3 camera, mix pre Mark one or two plus monopod situation if possible, please. What cable would I need to buy? Uh, from UK Multimedia, or sorry, UK Media. Um, I think, give me just one second here. I'm pulling out my MixPre 3 here. I was just looking at this earlier this week, and I think there's a separate setting specifically for this for the Fuji. Under record. Record trigger. Yeah, so if you go under the to the main menu, actually, can we show this in the overhead? I might have to refocus, but let's try it. Okay, so if I go to the menu, I go to the record menu. Second page, I go to the rec trigger. In here, there's HDMI flag for Fujifilm. So it looks like Fujifilm is using a different set of HDMI flags. My guess is that you'll set it to that. Then in terms of cables, what you'll need is you will need to get an HDMI cable. It's HDMI micro on the mixed pre side and whatever the Fuji has on its side is what you'll need. And then when that, that HDMI cable um, connection along, there, there may be settings in the Fuji camera too, probably under the HDMI menu, not, not familiar with that camera, but that will enable the camera to send flags to the Mix Pre to start recording. So whenever you press record on the Fuji, you'll also get um, the Mix Pre starting on the recording as well. Okay. Let's see what's next here. Okay. Why not use higher end IEMs for recording and mixing? From Roland. Uh, why not? By all means, you definitely could. I have no objections to that, <laughs> and a lot of a lot of mixers are doing that. Um, some mixers, it's a personal preference, frankly. Um, some mixers don't like to have to pull the like if they feel like they have to pull their headphones off frequently. I think IEMs are going to become problematic from that standpoint. Um, and so, you know, it really depends on your workflow and the kind of productions you're working on. But I personally prefer to use over-ear headphones because I can pull them on and off pretty quickly, um, especially if I'm booming. When you're booming, sometimes, I know Alan Williams has talked about this. He's a boom operator. Um, sometimes you need to just kind of slide one ear off, and you can actually do that. Some people can do it. I have a really long neck, so I, don't, I can't do it as well. I actually have to reach up and move it back. But um, being able to pull the one ear cup off quickly is really helpful. So that's a circumstance where an IEM would probably not be an ideal solution. Um, but if you're into that, if, if you have a good set of IEMs, uh, for those that don't know, IEM stands for in-ear monitor, then that can be a perfectly legitimate way to approach things as well. So there, there, there are some really, really impressive in-ear monitors these days. I actually bought a set of um, Shure in-ear monitors, just a low-end, like $100 in-ear monitors. And they're not perfect, but man, they're pretty good. So I think it's a legitimate solution if, again, you don't need to pull them off very often. Do you think Zoom will add mix minus to the F6? And does the F8 support mix minus? So no, natively they don't support it. Will they add it? I don't know. Um, I would think that all the technology is there and that a firmware update could do that. Um, but they, and they seem to be putting it in all their podcast gear. So they have it in their pod track P4. They have it in their new P8, which just was announced this week. Um, I think they've got it in their L8 as well. So they definitely have the capability to do it. I would love to see them do that on the F series as well. But as far as I'm aware, they haven't done it yet. So, all right. I, I, 
I have a live sound question for video conferencing. Is there such a device that would subtract one signal from another? Uh, probably. Uh, oh, more. The use case is video conferencing where you want to remove your computer audio from your mic signal path input. Can a sound device's item do this? You want to remove the computer audio output from your mic. Uh, so in other words, it sounds like you have some computer audio playing in the same space where you're miking. I I'm not really clear on whether you're having an issue with routing where you're, you're capturing all the audio, say for example, in OBS and sending it out on the live stream and you only really want to send the mic. Um, so that's a different, that's a different solution than if you're talking about computer audio playing well and it's playing in a room through speakers and it's getting into the microphone signal. Um, RTX voice could potentially do that, but it's, you know, there's a risk there that it's going to affect the dialogue sound. So I don't know if that's what you're specifically talking about, but that's a possibility there. If you do have an RTX, an NVIDIA RTX video card, that's one option. There are some other real time noise reduction items. This is another case too, where you'd want to use the polar pattern of your microphone. So if you have the microphone, the microphone's null, the backside where if you're using a cardioid, for example, where it doesn't pick up a lot of sound aimed towards the speakers, that will cut down the amount of the speakers that the microphone picks up. So not really clear on, on what you're doing there, but hopefully those two, you know, those thoughts get you a little closer to a solution. So thanks for the question. Um, can you show the sound devices 888's RF filtering options? I cannot show them right now. I had to send my SL2 in for the recall. Um, I guess I can talk about that just a little bit. It has to be attached to the 888 to show the RF filtering. Um, they, so they've recalled the SL2 and, um, what the, what they did was they found that there was a super slot um, slot receiver, or a, yeah, a slot receiver from another manufacturer, which didn't work really well with the retention clip, like the physical clip they were using to hold the, the slot in receivers in place. And basically what it was, it was kind of this, like this little arm that comes down with a, with rubber on it and kind of provided some friction to hold the slot in place, um, the slot receiver in place. And evidently they had to change it so that it would be compatible with this particular receiver. And I don't even know which receiver it was. It wasn't audio limited. Mine was working fine. Um, so I wrote them back and said, well, do I really need to get this fix, this fix, if I'm not planning on using that other receiver? And they said, well, you'll want to do it anyway, because the new mechanism is a lot better. So I sent it in last week and I just got notice on Friday. I think that they'd shipped it back. So it should be here early this coming week. Um, maybe we can show that next week, but, um, that was, that was the change that they did on the recall. So I think all the new units that go out from here on out should have that new mechanism on it. Um, but yeah, we can show you the RF filtering. It's just some additional frequencies at this point. That's what the um, that's what the firmware update provides is the ability to filter some additional frequencies. And for those that are not familiar with that concept, basically what happens is when you're using an RF distribution or, or shared an, shared antennas or you know external antennas like a shark fin antenna or something like that, a lot of times what you want to do is apply a filter to filter out all the frequencies that you're not interested in that you're not currently using. And that'll give you a cleaner signal overall. So that's the that's what this all this whole discussion is about. So thanks for that, Ken. In Final Cut Pro 10, for dialogue track of interviews from various people, should I create compound clips of each person's interview and add EQ filters or export each and EQ then re-import? Well, you can do that either way. Um, the you know the round trip, the export and re-import is kind of a is a potentially heavier workflow. Um, but it's a it's a legitimate one. I think it really depends on what you what works best for you. Um, but you could do it either way. If you're just doing if you're just doing an EQ, um, you could just do that in Final Cut and never have to take it out of there. So just put each interview E on a different track or each participant in the interview on a different track and EQ each of them independently. So that's how I would probably approach it, unless you have some additional things you need to do as well. All right, from Greg. Greg, hope you're doing well. It's good to hear from you. Can you address how to set up wireless frequencies for mixed systems such as 1G3 in A band and 1G3 in A1 band, or say an audio limited A10 and G3 system to avoid intermodulation? Um, 
I would, I, well, I, I'm probably not really prepared to talk about that in depth here. <laughs> So, um, but it's a good topic. And in fact, let me just make a note because that's a good topic that will be covered in the wireless course. That's a great example of the type of thing that we'll cover in the wireless course, because a lot of people don't under, even understand, you know, what is the concept of intermodulation and what does it mean and how do I avoid it? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and drop a note here just for our upcoming sound for video sessions to cover that. And in fact, we're probably going to have Michael Wynn come in in the next few weeks here and hopefully next week if everything works out. And we're going to cover a bunch of wireless topics. So I'm going to kind of hold on to that one, if that's OK, Greg. And we're going to cover intermodulation. Um, intermodulation and, and uh, frequency coordination is really what we're talking about here. OK, so I've made a note on that. Coordination. OK, thanks for the recommendation there. Um, in the Zoom F6, can inputs be panned to either left or right uh, to the left-right track. I know the line output of the F6 can. Yes, each individual input, excuse me, um, can be routed. Yeah, it can be panned left or right. So you go into the input menu, and there's a pan there, I believe. Let me just double click, check that. Let's pop over to the overhead cam. Okay, overhead cam, here we go. So if I go here, you can see there's a pan. So right now it's panned to the center. You can pan that left or right, however you like. All right. Next question. Got time for just a couple more here. Uh, we lost our key again. There we go. Ken asks, do you have any recommendations for a portable folding stand that can hold a long boom pole for interviews. Ooh, I have to confess, I almost always use C stands, and it's debatable whether you would consider those portable. Um, they're heavy <laughs> and they take up a lot of room. So usually, I, I have turtle base stands that I can actually remove this, the bottom, the legs from the upright, and um, so I can usually fit those even in a car. Um, but if you're looking for something lighter and smaller than that. Um, I did have Impact make some, some stands. You can find those over at B&H. They have some Impact Boom stands that are worth looking at. They're slightly, they'll fold up to be a little bit smaller. Um, but to get something that I feel, really feel comfortable with, you'd want to get one that has, um, they have kind of a hook on the opposite end of the boom so you can hang a sandbag to offset the weight. So I would consider using one of those. And then you have to carry around a sandbag as well, which of course you have to do that with a C stand anyway too. So. Um, booming a microphone requires a stand that's fairly substantial, and I'd be really careful. Um, I always bring sandbags to weight those down, and I've been using C stands, which are pretty sturdy, and I've never had a problem with one tipping over. So the problem with them is that they're just heavy and big. So maybe, uh, yeah, the Impact has some boom stands that are worth looking at. All right, trying to sync my MixPre 10.2 using BNC out to my Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K mic input. For some reason, it doesn't sync the time code. Am I missing something? Uh, Stan, we need to see the details to know. So you've got evidently a BNC to 3.5 millimeter, I would assume, so that you come into the aux input on the mix pre. Oh, no, you're using BNC. You're mix pre 10, so you've got a BNC in and... Okay, so you're using BNC out, and then you're going to 3.5 millimeter on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Sorry, getting my mind straight here. Um... It could be the cable. I, I, we need to know more details about that cable. Um, I would look, yeah, it would probably be the cable would be my first thing. Um, also, yeah, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras are kind of nice from the standpoint that when you plug a time code source into the 3.5 millimeter input, they just say, oh, it's time code. Okay, we'll follow this. So it, it, at least in my, the testing I've done so far, that's what they do. And it's worked really nicely, so... Um, yeah, if you could send us more details about that cable, that'd be great. Emma, if you could go back to the very first comment at the start before we even went live, there was a question someone had there. Um, yes, from Mark. Uh, Mark, I did see you sent an email over. I haven't had a chance to respond to it, um, but but Mark is working with a tentacle sync, um, GH5. I believe you're running the GH5 into an Atomos Ninja 5. Um so I would assume that you have the tentacle sync connected to the GH5's mic input, and then you're sending HDMI out of the GH5 into the Ninja 5. 
And then you also have an audio recorder. I can't remember which audio recorder you have, but I think it was a, I think it was an F6. Maybe it's a mix pre. I can't remember. Um, but in any case, if you could send a video of showing us how you have everything set up, how you did the jam syncing, how you set everything up, and then the problem that you're experiencing in post, I assume you're using Tentacle Sync Studio. Uh, maybe you're using something else to convert the audio timecode to metadata timecode on the GH5 footage. If you could send us a video showing all that, I think we could help you narrow that down. So thanks for that question. All right, we've got time for one last question, if you have one. Okay. Oh, it's Kevin, the basic filmmaker. Does Emma get double time pay for working on Sunday? Do you? I do not. No, she gets... She doesn't work that many hours a week, but um, she does not... Dang it, Kevin, you make me seem like an ogre. <laughs> Tell him that the wage is good enough. I don't um, need double. She, she said that the wage is good enough that she doesn't need double. So <laughs> um, anyway, thank you. Uh, you know, that's an interesting point. I uh, Thanks, Kevin, for putting me on the spot. Really appreciate you, buddy. Um, anyway, uh, so there is our sound for video session for this week. I hope everyone found that helpful. Thanks so much for uh, for all the questions that you sent ahead of time. Those are really helpful. And Hopefully the chat here with our community of, we've got a lot of great people in the community that know a lot of great stuff and have contributed a whole ton. I can't thank you enough. So thanks for doing all of that, each of you. Get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.